Hey guys, we're back, and we will now make an attempt at answering some of the questions we got on the Twitter stream. So we're just going to shoot really fast through all the different questions. Um, should we, like, repeat them first? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, Gildardo Garcia, what would be your recommendation for the get out of the building phase of the customer development process? Good question. That was one of the first questions, so I guess we actually answer that question throughout the session, because the answer would be to focus, uh, to follow the focus framework when you're getting out of the building, to be structured around the way you conduct your interviews. Uh, we send you a link about how to structure those interviews. Uh, so those will be some of the most important recommendations. The, the, the term getting out of the building simply means that we're not relying on the things that we think are true. It means that we're using customer-driven data to determine what's real. So you don't literally have to get out of the building. It has everything to do with are you collecting data from your customers that is outside the building. Next question. So um, how do you know if the feedback you get from your ideas is really useful or if it can add some value to your startup? So if you get out of the building and you get a lot of feedback, what do you trust? What do you discard? Mm. So this is all it comes down to your success metric that you're measuring. Remember, we've defined ultimate success for the company, <coughs> and then we've backfilled for a specific experiment we're going to define success. So it's valuable whether or not it helps you determine that success metric. That doesn't mean it's valuable if, it's, if it, you succeed. It doesn't mean if it's valuable if it fails. It's valuable if it's helping you determine whether or not you're succeeding or failing for a specific experiment. It's unvaluable if you say, I'm trying to measure the number of people who cite this problem, and what I'm doing is I'm asking people for pre-sales. Because now you're, you're getting data that's going to give you, uh, that's not going to give you an answer to your question. Yeah. And from Gabby here, how can you evade the fear of making mistakes? Eventually someone's going to make a mistake, and it will be at a high cost. Uh, so that's more on the kind of corporate culture side, right? Um, and, and, and it's not easy to, uh, to change. One of the things we did at uh, Vestas Wind Systems where I worked previously was to make a lot of initiatives uh, in order to change that kind of culture. Because uh, one thing is to implement an idea management system. We talked about that last time where you want to encourage employees to come up with ideas, to share their ideas, and we're going to take some of the best ones. But if people are afraid of making mistakes and saying something stupid, you're not going to get a whole lot of, whole lot of ideas in the beginning. So we put on a number of different kind of ideation type of events, like fun brainstorming events where we got together in a casual setting, uh, and we made fun of ourselves. And one of the things that's really important is to bring the management in to those events and have the management go up and uh, be silly, and, like make fun of themselves, themselves or come up with a stupid idea. So you need to set those examples. In the management, they have to be the ones that come out and really... Uh, kind of lead by example, right, and, and, and be the first ones up there uh, screwing up, saying something silly, uh, mm. and, and being casual. That's the way where the employees will also get encouraged to say, ah, okay, well, if, if, if the, the, the VP here of uh, technology is up there doing a silly game or whatever, it's probably okay now to uh, say what comes to mm. my mind mm. instead of me having to hold back for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of top-down approach. I like that. Yeah. From a personal perspective, on the founder side, uh, there's we talk a lot about failure. We sort of accept failure, but the truth is, failure hurts. There's no doubt about it. It sucks. It hurts. Um, so what I do now is I do this for myself, and I do it for the founders that I work with. I um, ahead of time I build a failure protocol. And this is a, a three-step process that helps me understand what exactly I'm going to do when I get a failed uh, experiment. Because we like to say, it's like, oh, you just keep going down the process. And you're just like, oh, it sucks. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if you can see it. Oh. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, we can talk more about that later. But basically, it has to do with taking care, reflecting on, on like, feeling the experience, feeling the pain, acknowledging it. Then it's all about going back and checking, what is my ultimate success again? Yeah. You know, is it still the same? If it's the same, then maybe I will find some way to go and sort of get back on the horse after some time and go after that success. If the success, the ultimate success that I wanted is now different, then I'll go and, and I'll realign. Yeah, you know? yeah and in, in order to reach success, you need to make all those mistakes. So you can also say, well, every time you fail, every time you make a mistake, you got a little bit closer to actually finding the real solution, right? Like Thomas Edison, right? I have not failed. Uh, 1,300 times on how to invent the light bulb. I have successfully discovered 1,300 new ways of how not to invent the light bulb, right? <laughs> so you've, been, you've found a lot of ways on how not to do it, but if you acknowledge that all those steps are necessary in order to find the right solution, then you are making progress. Yeah, you're failing, but the more times you fail, the more ground you've covered. Now you've gotten a little bit closer to understanding 
how the actual solution will work. Yeah. Great, from Pepito, um, how can we achieve the goal of product <laughs> shipping? Uh, so I'm not 100% sure what's meant with this question. Uh, it actually says, home, we can achieve the goal of product shipping. But I guess it's like, how can we achieve to ship our products, right? Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna... yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> product shipping, I, it, from a business perspective, is not a goal. Product shipping is a product manager's goal, <laughs> right? From a business and corporate innovation, like that's a nothing. Product shipping is only helpful in that it can help us measure something. And that's what we want to think about launching the same way. We want to think about all these things. That, that, and even fundraising. None of these things are, uh, are things we want to strive for in them themselves. They are things we want to strive for so that we can learn more about our market or more about our business. So Gerardi asks, um, what happens if a corporation decides to be a startup? What are the differences between them? And we did cover that a little bit in the previous talk. We talked about the differences between a startup and a corporation are quite fundamental. A lot of people think that a startup is a small version of a big company that's essentially the same thing, just smaller. But it's not. In a startup company, you don't really know what you're doing yet. And that's why you're focused on searching for all those answers mm -hmm. that you realize that all we have right now is all these assumptions. We assume we understand who the customers are. We assume we understand what problem they have. And we assume that the product we have in mind will solve the problem for these people and they'll be willing to pay us for it. Most likely that's not the case. No. So a startup is searching for all those answers and only when you get to a point where you found those answers and you can start executing and you know how to basically build this repeatable and scalable business model, uh, you will eventually turn into a corporation. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you are not going to continue being a startup. Eventually you will evolve into being a company that knows what it's doing. Uh, but as long as you're kind of reinvesting all the money just in, in searching a new development, I guess you, there are many different definitions of a startup. I think a lot of people kind of don't really agree on, on that. But that would be my uh, definition that a startup is searching and the companies are executing. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A, a company that's starting to be a startup, <coughs> that can only happen if the company is willing to give up on the business model that they are already executing on. So that can happen. Sometimes someone's like, oh... I don't know if an example comes to mind. Like, oh, Netflix. Used to, that really used to be a mailing. You used to mail mail DVDs, right? Yep. So they went startup again, right? They're like, we, they spun off that business, the whole DVD mailing back and forth. They spun that off. They started again with, uh, with streaming. So you don't take an existing business model and then turn it into a startup unless you're giving up on that business model. That usually means spinning it off, shoving it away, and then starting this new entity. But I guess part of what we also talked about today was how large corporations – they cannot come up with great product development inside the existing corporation. So they need to essentially set up this new business uh, development organization that have a different company culture, they have their own resources, and they're not being measured by ROI mm -hmm. that Justin talked about, return on investment, right? Because that then it simply wouldn't matter. Uh, it wouldn't work because they uh, you can't prove ROI on a new idea. So you need to set up a new startup uh, for, funded by the big business in, in the beginning. I think that... that that might come pretty close to answering this question. Um, yes, so that's a way a corporation that realize we can't really do it well enough. We need to be a startup again, but we can't turn the entire business into a startup. So we set up this new startup that has its own brand and, and its own way of doing things. Next question. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> All right, from Kim. Uh, what do you do about the complaining customers? Do you solve their problem? Mm, okay, so what do we think the context is here? So I guess the, uh, this was pretty early in the talk. So I guess Kim is asking us uh, about oh, yeah, what yeah, we're yeah. talking about. All the people yelling at you, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's great news. They're calling you. Um, you're going to be really, really honest with them. You're going to say, "Hey, thank you so much for taking the time." Um, you're going to be very empathetic because they're giving you incredible feedback. So you're going to really try and understand their problem, and they're not going to be complaining for long because you're going to you're basically going to say, "You are right." You were right. We definitely screwed this up. Thank you so much for calling. I'm so sorry that this happened. And you're just going to make them feel so good and incredible because, because you will love on them so much. They won't be complaining for very long because you're going to take them incredibly seriously. Um, yeah, and it won't be an issue. I've had people come Yeah, and you're going to refund them money. You're going to buy them coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to call them. <coughs> Free products. Yeah, because yeah. it's going to be well worth whatever amount you're going to charge to just get their feedback. Not to worry. I mean, this is not so much. We're not worried about the stage of virality and getting sort of brand damage or anything. It's just the information they're giving you is worth so yeah. much. 
Yeah, those early customers really have to be early adopters, mm-hmm. have to become your best friends, right? Because they're willing to dedicate their time to complain about your product. I mean, feedback is a gift, and that's something a lot of people don't realize. But every time somebody's willing to spend time on complaining, mm-hmm. that offers you an opportunity to improve your product. Mm-hmm. So take feedback as a gift. From Natalie, uh, how do you deal with reputation with customers complaining? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so okay, another same deal here. So a lot of us feel like our customers, okay, I'm going to take a split this, B2B and B2C, okay? On the B2B world, we're genuinely concerned that, uh, that there aren't very many customers. If we burn these bridges, we will never get to come back. So we do not want to give them anything less than an optimal experience. <coughs> so, <coughs> so in the B2B scenario, what I want you to do is I want you to treat every interaction as a collaboration. Every interaction is a chance for you to first understand their problem and then talk to them about a potential solution for it. So this is, um, yeah, this is just a real, just hands-on, like, hey, I heard you say these problems. What do you think? Is this going to solve those problems? Do you think it's going to be helpful? <clears throat> and then you're going to collaborate with them. So that, you're not going to worry about burning bridges on the B2B side. On the B2C side, oftentimes we think that, like, oh, my gosh, these first customers that I get are going to be the only customers I get. And that's why we do the optimizing of the channel. We have to have a sustainable number of people coming into our channel to run tests on currency tests, utility tests. So that's why we run the optimizing the channel stuff early so we can get those people flowing in. So if we do make mistakes, when we do make mistakes, we will be helpful to those people and try and earn their trust back. Um, Oftentimes we won't, though, but it's going to be okay because we found a channel to find more. I know it's going to sound scary. It's going to sound like... I don't want to piss off any customers. The truth is, uh, if you don't take the time to really iterate with your customers, you will not have any customers at the end of the day to serve at all. So, um, yeah. So that's the answer to that question. Um, Henrik is uh, on fire, I think. I think he's got some sort of wow, issue crazy. with his... So I'm going to try and take over here. I'm just going to start from the back and we'll get together. How much time and money... is is it convenient to invest in testing time? Okay, so this question is interesting because I um, this happens a lot. Like, how much time should we spend on testing? Um, the, the idea is, at any time you don't spend on testing, uh, is going to be spent wasted. Is wasted time. I would argue uh, that all of your time and all of your money should be built on testing because testing is ultimately what builds the product. It's not, we don't just sit around testing for a long time <coughs> and then <coughs> go into a cave, take our results, and then produce something great. We're testing the entire way. So by the time we're done with our tests, done with our tests, we'll have built a successful business, right? But even after that, we're still testing new things, testing new channels, testing new marketing strategies. So testing never stops. Testing is a way of life. Uh, and, and there's no such thing as like, oh, I don't want to spend too much time interviewing because it's not, if you don't do that, you're going to get it wrong. Yeah. So Mariana Sanchez here, what is the best way to reduce risk when developing product? The best way to reduce risk is exactly what we're tell, telling you here about doing customer development, testing before you build stuff. Um, and yeah, the way you do that is by going through the steps we mentioned. Yeah. Lelo here asked, uh, what if the customers do not validate the idea? Is it a bad idea? And that's a good question. Ooh, it, it could be an awesome idea. It could be a great idea. Uh, Google Glass, like we talked about. The segue, awesome ideas. Are they awesome businesses? No. So we talked about timing a little bit too, right? So, uh, so this is how we figure out if now is the right time, right? This is how we figure out if WebBand's time is now. We go talk to customers. If there are people who are actively trying to solve this problem now, it might be the right time. If we can get enough currency testing, currency validation, it might be the right time. Um, so, yeah. And at some point, we're also going to talk about the market segmentation, where you realize there are different segments that have different types of needs mm-hmm. and want different types of solutions. Mm-hmm. So you might talk to a lot of customers who don't really validate your hypotheses and validate your assumptions, mm-hmm. but that's because you're, they are not actually the customer that you should be targeting. Mm-hmm. You think they are, but they're not. Yeah. And then you will talk to another people, and you start eventually looking at these patterns that we talked about and you'll find out, well, there's a pattern here about this type of user who tends to always say they have the same type of problem. Great. Now we know that those could be... We are back online. Uh, why are the corporations afraid of startups? No, oh, because the, you say... They, they have all the money. Right? It says, like, why are they afraid of startups? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they're going to get their lunch eat. <laughs> right? Uh, <coughs> 
<coughs> times are changing, yo. And if you're stuck in the innovator's dilemma, you're not going to be able to change with them. So inter- co- corporations should be scared. Now, truth is, it, corporations I know, executives I know, aren't scared enough. No, right. they're not. They don't realize that they're being disrupted. Uh huh. Uh huh. And they underestimate the power of these new young startups because exactly. they disregard them as these uh-huh. youngsters who nobody cares about. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what ends up happening is they end up. <laughs> I was I was talking to a, a big publishing company, you know, big books, you know, and uh, and the sink, the ship is sinking on publishing companies. Like that's no doubt about it. If you write things on physical paper, your business is not going well right now. No. Nope. And he knew it. He knew that things were going down the shitter. And, uh, and so we were talking about, like, hey, how can we do some of this innovation? And he's like, man, you know what? I, I know that my ship is sinking, but I don't have the buy-in to go build a new ship. Like, we're too scared. By the time it hits you, by the time you realize the corporation, yeah. it's too late, you're done. Yeah. Um, so they should be scared. So, Justin, what do you prefer, being an entrepreneur or being an entrepreneur? Oh, me personally, it's all about entrepreneur because I gotta, I gotta find my, I gotta follow my own path, and I need autonomy. But you can do this. You find the right culture. You find the right buy-in. This all, all the same stuff applies. Now, here's another trick: you can use customer development with your bosses, with your peers inside an organization. You can get buy-in for a project by understanding what your boss wants and their boss wants. Um, so the same things can apply, but it's me. Yeah. I mean, when you're a founder, you kind of want to be a founder, you want to be on boss. But entrepreneur is a great first step. And, uh, and being an entrepreneur where you actually get paid <laughs> and <laughs> benefits. Uh, you have all the benefits, you have all the safety, is a perfect way to start your career. Because then you start understanding an industry, you understand how things work. And then later on, when you maybe got a little bit of savings, so you know you can actually survive for six months or a year, um, without a paycheck, you can jump out and, and try life in a startup. That's what I did. Yep. Uh, could you give me a tip for selling the right way my ideas to a corporation? Can you? How should I sell my ideas to a corporation? Well, what do you think, Henrik? How do I sell anything to anybody? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough thing, and it, of course, completely depends on the context, right? What kind of uh, product are we using? But since you are asking us about how to sell an idea to a corporation, I guess you are trying to, are you trying to sell an idea or trying to sell a product? Um, well, it doesn't I matter. Guess, well, it doesn't matter because the only thing we're going to buy is a solution to a problem. Yes. Right? So, <laughs> so I guess that's the right tip no matter, gotta, <laughs> no matter what the context is. You need to figure out what is the, what is the pain that they are having right now. Mm-hmm. What do they really care about? And then ideally ask them to explain the problem to you in their own terms. And one of the tricks that Justin mentioned in, uh, in one of his uh, talks is that you will write down exactly how they phrase things, exactly how they explain what the problem is, and then you can parrot back that same explanation to them in your marketing materials. Mm-hmm. So you can basically use their own words against them, and that tends <laughs> to be pretty powerful. Against them is a little harsh. You're using anyway. their own words so you can help them solve their problem. One of the things I want to call out here is that we never, no one in the, in the history of mankind has ever solved a corporation's problem. No one in the history of mankind has ever sold something to a corporation. You sell something to a person in a corporation. Right? So you've got to find the role the person yeah. in a corporation who has the problem, they may or may not have the ability to buy it, but you, if they've got the problem, they can help you and you can help them go get buy-in from the right people. So know that you've got to find the person who's got a problem. Yeah. Um, the corporation won't have a problem. And then when we're talking about you know, selling to corporations, there are also these gatekeepers who will try to keep you out and try to keep you from talking to the real people in the organization. You need to find a sneaky way to kind of get around them to still get in touch with the right people. Okay, Carla here. If your startup company began with a bad reputation, mm. what do you do later for changing this company's image? Start a new one. <laughs> Start a new one? Or, um, it's, it's terms of, I guess in this context as well, we talk about shipping sometimes crappy products, right? We, we ship an, an MVP. And yeah, people are going to be mad because it doesn't really work that well. It doesn't have all the features and all that stuff. But one of the things that you realize as an entrepreneur is that it's a lot better to piss off <laughs> 10 or 15 or 100 people than to never have anyone at all. Than to never have anyone at all. <laughs> or to never understanding that what re- people really care about. Because sure, you have, you're going to have those uh, 50 people who are yelling at you and they're not happy with what they got, but then you're going to give them back that money and then you're going to, sorry, I'm so sorry about this, but can I take you off a coffee so you really can explain to me, you can really vent 
about all the things that were terrible about this product so I can improve it. Yeah. It's also, they're not going to be as mad as you think. These are early adopters. In that, in that broad example we talked about, if this is a person who's really experiencing some pain, I promise you it's going to be much more of a collaboration to solve the problem than they're going to be pissed off. Yeah, so uh, Esteban here. Uh, how can you measure customers' acceptance if you are a startup with low budget? Acceptance, and what do you mean that we know? Yeah, I think he means, um, I think it's all about the whole, the testing phase. How can we do that with the low budget? Isn't, this sounds really expensive. Oh, yeah, that's the whole thing. This is crazy inexpensive. <laughs> it's super inexpensive. Right? Um, yeah, so uh, now all of these things have very specific techniques, like, like there's false door tests. Uh, false doors when you drive people to a web page or in an app or anything, and you, you hint that a feature is there. And then you simply measure how many people open that door, how many people click on that feature, how many people go uh, click on that button. I did it on my blog. For a long time, I was trying to measure, do people want a book about the Focus Framework? Do they want a video series? Do they want a mentoring program? What do they want? So I just had a, an ad that said, hey, Focus Framework, check this out. And then I tried it with books. I tried it with video. I tried it with mentoring. And I measured how many people clicked. When they got to the next page, I said, thank you so much for your interest. Here's the, I'm going to send you an email about the book, blah, 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 blah. But all I cared about was the number of people clicking. So there are, you know, dozens of these different tests and techniques. All of them have been optimized to not cost very much money because they're built by startups, organizations that don't have money. Um, so when Henry talked about getting a, a new team, like 10 million bucks, he's like, ah, no, they're going to go build something. Give them 10 bucks. So well, that's to my defense because I was thinking about some of these large research organizations that need money, significant capital for new uh, testing equipment. Like who? Like Grunfuss, that I work with, the largest pump manufacturing company in the world. Mm. They want to set out a new uh, water uh, treatment research, basically station up in Fresno. Okay. And they needed some pretty significant money because some of the equipment that they wanted to test and play with is just bloody expensive. So they couldn't do it for $10. So who is requiring that they go get that data? They're testing out whether they want to convert their pumping industry into a water water company. And they need to figure out, can we invent some new smart um, water treatment uh, technologies? So they're asking the question, so it's part can of I build this product? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Have they found customers that were willing to pay for that yes. new product yeah. already? Yeah. So it's a little will, they, will those customers give them money to go build that new product. But in some of those B2B industries, you kind of, they kind of need to see it at some point. It was, so okay. it was a little later, later uh -huh. stage. Uh -huh. Maybe we can find a middle ground here. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. for the customer development, customer discovery at least stage, you don't need really any, any uh -huh. uh, significant uh -huh. funding. But yeah. in, a, in a new business unit, mm -hmm. there might be some funding required in order to actually... Well, that's the thing. It's not new, build. right? Like they can't have been new. If they were new and just starting off with building the product, like something went wrong, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Unless, unless they say, because that's not a business unit, that's a product unit at that point. Well, was, they are investigating numerous different types of products. Anyway, we're kind of getting sidetracked. Okay, but I think this is an interesting debate, though. Sure. Because uh, cause a lot, of, I've, I see this happen all the time. Founders, we trick ourselves into thinking, I got to go build a thing, I got to go build a thing, I got to go build a oh, thing. Yeah. And if we're not building it with customers' money, or at least the promise of customers' money, we got, we're doing something wrong. So, now that said, sometimes the customer will say, yeah, letter of intent, if you can solve these problems, I promise to pay you. It's a non-binding agreement, simple piece of paper um, that you get them to sign. And sometimes, to actually get the money, you have to build the thing. So, no doubt about that. But I'm just going to challenge, anytime someone says, I'm going to drop 10 million bucks, it's like, okay, make sure that you're, you're going to get your money back. Yeah. If you, if you In this situation, it was actually even more. But, but, and they had already done the customer development. I helped them actually go around to researchers at Stanford University. I helped them go out to water treatment plants. Mm. And they found a market where they needed these um, treatment facilities to be modular. So they built a, a water treatment facility inside a container that they could move mm. around easily and dump down to wherever they're building a new mm. um, village or whatever <clears throat> in China. But they had to actually have proof of concept. So mm. it was later in the stage. Gotcha. Okay, so, um, but how much money do you have or do you need to invest in the testing part? Do you want to put a number on that? As much as it takes. As much as it yeah, takes. Yeah, we entered this already, but testing is a way of life. It's not <laughs> a phase. So you're going to do it the entire time. And the, the goal is to spend the least amount of resources, time and money, 
on the entire thing to find the right optimal approach to get the product market fit. So Cynthia here, she's done some homework. She asked, is it more effective to do the business model canvas or the focus model oh, to validate the business? Oh, great question. <laughs> yeah, business model canvas. Okay, so truth be told, focus framework comes straight from the business model canvas, right? And it comes straight from my work with startups using the business model canvas. Now, here's what I've seen in the real world when I talk and use the business model canvas. You've done it too, right? You use it all the time. Yep. So it's super fun to talk about. We hang out, we play with it, we put sticky notes on it, and then you go back a couple months later, and there's so few startups who are using it anymore, right? It's just sort of like, oh, I did it once, I kind of understand. But then I ask them, hey, what are your problems? What, what problems do you run into uh, at you know, someone practicing lead startup? They say, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do next. And that's because the business model canvas tells you all things that you need to test, but it doesn't tell you the order to test them in or how to do it. So what I'm doing with the focus framework is I take those uh, nine boxes in the business model canvas, I combine some as appropriate to make sure there are fewer, and then I stack them all. So... Um, they're all the same. Everything's the same as in the business model canvas, but it's focus framework. It just tells you when to do them and then how to do them as well. Great question. So Maria asks, uh, so without a big budget, how can you scale? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. So you realize, I guess you've gone through, um, <coughs> F F U <laughs> F F O C <laughs> U. Uh -huh. and, uh, and you've identified that, hey, there's a huge opportunity here. Uh -huh. Problem is, I have absolutely no money to, uh, to set up production, to ramp up marketing efforts, to do sales. Uh -huh. What can I do? Well, it turns out that you don't have no money. You ain't poor anymore because in C, you did currency testing, right? You got money from the customer, or at least the promise of money from the customer. So that promise of money you can take to an investor. Um, you can... Yeah, that's basically it. You can take it to an investor. Uh, or if it's real money, then you can use that for the development. So you yeah, think of Kickstarter, right? This is what Kickstarter is all about. Crowdfunding campaigns, uh -huh. crowdfunding platforms will enable you to get that capital yeah. in pre-orders. Uh -huh. So instead of you putting out that money, you actually let the customers take that risk with you. Uh -huh. They believe you are the one to build it and they want it, so they pay up front. Yeah, exactly. And I, I usually work out an arrangement where I say, I will, this is a pre-order, but I'm not going to actually charge you until... Uh, I launched the product because mm -hmm. then they're not putting any risk out there. They don't have to worry about me running away with the money, um, but they know that I know that their money is there sitting there waiting for me. And what's more important than the money, really, honestly, is the data. It's data that knowing that people will buy the stuff uh, when it goes to market. Um, and then as far as other questions go, I, I always think about a, you know, a customer-funded company is so much more powerful um, if you can actually scale. So think about smaller ways to scale. We're not going to start putting up TV ads, right, because those are, those are unfocused and they're not going to be um, very effective. So we're going to start just keeping small, small channels and start building those together. And then once we get our war chest up, now we can start making bigger plays. Mm -hmm. Great and, and on that um, point, actually, Marco asked, if a product is really profitable and have customers, but it's not scalable, can we consider that a, a startup? Oh, good question. And, and do, yeah. we wanna, I guess, do we want to work on that? Yeah, that depends, again, on your success criteria. So this happens. You can do this. Like uh, a consulting, right? Consulting is not scalable unless you want to go hire a bunch of other people, right? So uh, you can have a, a very nice, comfortable life and success doing that if that's what your success metric is. So, um, so yeah, it depends on what your success is. If you can't scale and you need it to scale, then no, it's not a good business for you. Yeah. It also depends on how much money you can get from those few customers, right? I mean, if all your 10 customers are multi-billionaires and they're paying you $100 million <coughs> each, well, that's pretty good business, I'd say. And uh, the, uh, to be honest, as an entrepreneur, if you can deal with fewer, higher-paying customers, it's a lot easier. Dealing with hundreds of thousands of, of users can sometimes be tricky because it needs a lot more customer service and so on. So, so sometimes fewer, you know, high high profit customers can be uh, can be preferable. Um, how do you determine whether I am capable of starting a business? You are next. You are capable. <laughs> how can we improve the drive that our employees don't have? That's a good one, right? So, if you, it's from Fur here. Uh, who's uh, putting herself in, in the position of an innovation manager who now has this team who are just not very driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. How can we incentivize people to work harder? Okay, I want to answer this question. I also want to go back to the other person and help them out. Give them a little bit. <laughs> but um, for, for this question right here, 
I think of inside an organization, I think of everyone above to the side and below me as customers. So the way that I'm going to solve my problem, if I want more innovative thinking, I need to understand who is it that I need to get buy-in from and solve their problem. So I'm going to go sit down and have a conversation with each of my employees and say, hey, what's up? Like, what, what's, what does success look like for you? And how can I help you get that? If it's, you know, I want to clock in at 9 to 5. I just want to hang out and chill and, and support my family. Awesome. Good. Let's go transfer you to another team. right? Because my success requires something else. If the person I talk to says, you know what, I really want to look for growth, promotion opportunities. Awesome. Maybe I can design something to help them do that. Um, so, so you don't think you can actually transform people into becoming more innovative? I'm not going to try and solve a problem that someone doesn't have. If being more innovative is not going to help them solve their problem, mm -hmm. if they really just want to chill, right, and do their thing and raise their family. But not, it's not really about a problem here. We're talking about an employee who goes to work. They might never have considered becoming an innovator and, and becoming more um, actively involved in new product development. Maybe they could get really excited, but how can we incentivize that? I, I have not we... seen anyone change behavior without some sort of internal motivation to do so. So maybe, maybe you've got some recipe that can take someone who's like, I'm happy clocking in here <laughs> and doing what I do every day, and you can turn them into an innovator. But I'd much rather take the person who's like, I'm striving, I want to go start a company, and like, you're on my team now, <laughs> and you're going to start a company here, and you're going to practice here. And that person, I'm going to go find another one for them. What, what do you think? No, but that's a really interesting question, right? And it kind of comes back to <laughs> your philosophy, whether you want to, if you're looking at the pyramid of the organization, right, do you want to take the entire bottom of the pyramid and try to coach them and incentivize them to be slightly more innovative? Or do you want to take the top 100 people or the top 10 people in that organization and provide them with all the resources so they can really go and do awesome stuff? Hmm. Right? And, uh, and I think a lot, of research, a lot of research has been done in this field, and it, it turns out that it, it, there's more ROI, there's more return on investment in investing in those top performers. Hmm. So to your point, uh, it, it's probably better use of your time to go and find other employees or to find the employees in your organization who, is, who are actually interested in becoming uh, innovators. However, I have seen, especially in certain cultures where innovation has just not been promoted in any way, where there are people that will suddenly start to come out when you uh, run an event where they are allowed to come up with their ideas, they're being listened to, because mm -hmm. uh, there might sometimes be people from the bottom of the pyramid that are working in the manufacturing unit, but no one ever cared to listen to their ideas. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden you come over and say, like, well, here is a completely uh, flat uh, hierarchy, hierarchical structure, because anyone can submit an idea and we'll listen to all of you. Then all of a sudden they're being listened to and they will be empowered by that mm. to suddenly come out. And so, so I guess there are ways to incentivize uh, employees to become more innovative by making sure they feel listened to and they feel that management is supporting mm. uh, their efforts and, uh, and are rewarding that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it's a tricky one. Yeah. Only other thing I'll add is, oh, we want to go, go back to that one. If you find people who want to make impact, anyone who says, oh, I want to have an impact on the world, yeah, look for that person because that, that's the problem you can help them solve. Okay, what was that? How do I know if I'm... So the, to right, tell me whether I'm capable of starting this. Yeah, so, so this is a question. The answer we said is yes. Um, so you've got some sort of doubts about your capabilities. If you, um, if you can achieve your success, if your success, your personal success, can be achieved through entrepreneurship, you can do this. And if that's something that you want to go do... Um, if your personal success has nothing to do with entrepreneurship, if you can do it through a regular job or through no job at all, then more power to you, man. Entrepreneurship is not the answer for everybody. But look at what you want in life, and then if the best way to get that is through entrepreneurship, rock and roll. Yeah. So from Walter, uh, thanks for this question. How do you ask a person what they think about your product you're trying to make if the product is kind of hard to explain? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't ever ask customers about what they think about my product. <clears throat> what I ask my customers are, uh, what are your problems? What problems are you explaining? Okay. Then I'm going to ask, uh, will you basically go to my landing page? Right? Like, will you go? And that's not like I don't explicitly ask. It's an ad. But on that landing page, you will need to explain what you're doing. Okay. So then I will explain. Ah, I don't explain what I'm doing per se. I explain the problem that they have. Right. Mm -hmm. I make a connection with them, and then I talk about promising a solution to that problem. Maybe. Being the product that's hard to explain. Ah, maybe it's the product, maybe it's the product, <laughs> maybe it's not. So here's the thing. Like we think 
that customers buy products. So we think, hey, here's the problem you have. Let me tell you about this great product. Remember, they don't actually give a shit about your product. What they care about is solving a problem. So you say, here's your problem, your discomfort, you hate your sports bra. I'm going to solve this problem using greatest technology, new fabrics, blah, 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 right? But I don't actually, they don't actually care. They don't care about like the measurements and how it all works. No one cares about your product. So you can sell all this stuff just by talking about the problem and the solution if you've got a little bit of social proof to, to show. Um, now, what I care about is will they buy the thing or will they do the thing, give me currency, time or attention. And in that case, I put the product in front of them and then I see will they give me something valuable. Will they give me currency or will they give me attention? Another way, of course, and maybe we'll have time to, to actually dive into pitching strategies at a later stage uh, that might enable you to present your product in a slightly more concise and, and better way. Uh, but definitely having a prototype and sort of visualizing, <laughs> visualizing the functionality of your product will make it much easier for people to, to understand. Because mm -hmm. talking about all the features, talking about all the things that you're going to do is typically quite hard. If you could show them how it works, people get it much faster. There's so many questions. We're not going to get through all these. Uh, uh, that's not interesting. <laughs> Don't say it's not interesting. They'll know. Or you didn't. Okay, what are the main differences between early adopters <laughs> and early majority? Oh, we're talking about that. Early adopters <laughs> are actively trying to solve the problem. <laughs> to use focus, do we always need to solve a specific problem without a solution? Oh, uh, it will not be a problem if the customer knows about the solution. Yeah? So if I talk to the bra person and, and she tells me it's a problem, that means she has not discovered a solution. So, yes. What are the best channels uh, for startups with a low budget? And again, completely depends on the industry, right? But The, the channels your customers use. Yeah, and, and typically, I mean, one channel is, of course, like online sales will be a pretty cheap channel to set up and mm -hmm. at least in the beginning you can literally have boxes in your apartment and you can go down to the post office, you can put a label on it and send it <coughs> uh, free. So that's, that's a channel that will be pretty, pretty inexpensive. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many different types of channels, right? But what you don't want to do is what Webvan did, like buy all their own delivery trucks uh, as the only channel to, uh, to ship your product to your customers. You don't want to do that. And you also don't want to pay a ton of money to, uh, for example, another channel to reach your customers would be to uh, set up TV commercials, right? TV ads, radio ads. Those are very expensive, so you don't want to do that. So you want to basically have a smart way of, of channeling, of, of accessing, reaching your customers. Um, Facebook, Google, Bing. Uh, stumble upon. Yeah, anything kind of online, because then you can very also be very quickly set up some metrics that will indicate what is the conversion rate. Is it worth my time? Every time I spend ten dollars on, on AdWords on Google, I get X amount of users in. X amount of those users convert into paying customers. Oh, okay, it's very pretty quick, fast to to recognize whether this is a good business or not. So that answer the question. Okay, how many people do I need to ask? about the problem that I think they have. Until you what find is the a pattern. Number of Until you find a pattern. Okay, could that be just like three people? Uh, I say start with five. Five, you won't find a pattern because you'll be, you'll be interviewing the wrong people. Then after those five, you'll be like, oh, you know, it's this one of the five that I want to target more of, then you're going to go find five more of those. <coughs> if you're <coughs> targeting a small enough customer segment, um, they will all have the same problem. You'll see a pattern. Oh, and after the interviews, which is an acceptable percentage to keep going? People agree with this versus disagree. Uh, it, whatever number you need to meet your success criteria. I know that's going to be lame and vague, uh, but that's all I've got for you right now. Okay. Isn't focus too expensive to adopt in our first startup? No, it's too expensive to not adopt the focus framework. Okay, because you're going to end up wasting a lot of money building products that people don't care about. You basically it. cannot afford. I don't get. I don't get the question. Like too expensive? What does that word mean? Well, I, I guess it's, it's. We've somehow communicated that it's expensive to do these tests. It is not. Oh, oh, oh. oh. It doesn't cost you anything. It, like going out, paying somebody a cup of coffee to sit down and, and talk to you about their problem. Yeah, it's not going to be expensive. You can do this stuff for a thousand. Bucks. How can you get currency of money for your projects without taking too long? How can you get currency of money for your projects without taking too long? Trysalary.com. 
Salary.com. Try salary. Try salary.com. Try salary.com. You can get people's credit card information. You can sell them stuff, but it won't charge their credit card until you tell them to. I use it all the time. It's awesome. Yeah, and I think also on customerdeadlabs.com, yeah. you can find some videos that describe how uh, how to actually do this. It's a good blog. It's a great blog, yeah. The, the guy is kind of weird. Yeah, he's kind of mean. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, um, how many samples are correct for a population? What, what if I have bias? Yeah, um, yeah. So sample size questions. Word. Uh, so, yeah, we're not doing statistical analysis um, because, because we're trying to be very inexpensive. So I hear your question. That is one of the reasons why we, we test everything. Because we're going to test with a very small sample size on do they have the problem. Then we're going to go for channel, right? And if it turns out that in our, in trying to get people via a channel at a larger sample size, we can't get the numbers, then something went wrong. Our initial test, our sample size was biased for too long, so we'll go back. Um, so don't waste a bunch of time trying to get statistical significance at the beginning. Get a little indication, then go test it at a larger scale. Do we have to make first a complete focus investigation before presenting your idea to a company? Or just the first three steps? <laughs> oh, and do, do you think it's a company to buy their product or to, to innovate? Yeah, it could be many things, right? Um, well, actually, it's also when you're presenting it to a potential uh, client, right? Whether that be the company or you're trying to pitch something to an investor. The more tests you've done, the mm. more convincing your mm. pitch will be, mm. right? So if you're trying to sell something to a company or you sell your business to a company, if you can prove that you've gone through these tests, you have this data to back up that what you're saying is actually correct. There are people out there who are willing to pay for your product. You've proven that you can scale it. You've proven you've done all these things. Yeah. So the more steps you've taken, the better. Uh, it's but, kind of too difficult to understand the exact concept. So in here, you'll, you'll find the answer in the very first conversation you have with whoever that person is who wants it, you're going to tell, you're going to ask them, what do you need to see from me in order to take the next step? Then you go get that, you go back, what else do you need to see? And you're going to go iterate over and over and over again. Daniela Hernandez, uh, what is the key to detect or become an early adopter? They're actively looking for a solution to a problem. Oh, there's actually uh, JPP I wanted to ask you. That's my bad. Uh, which is the process to create a good relationship with clients? Solve their problems. Identify their problems and solve them. Yeah, and, and especially with the early adopters, right? You want to really treat them nice, as we talked about earlier. It, buy their coffee, right? If you go into somebody, they're sitting down, spending the time with you, pay for their coffee, right? I, and then I, follow up afterwards I, and say, thanks for the interview. I don't buy coffee. You don't buy people's coffee? No, because then why are they sitting with me? Are they sitting with me because I'm buying their coffee or are they sitting with me because they have a real problem? No, but you will figure out that afterwards, if you set, had a coffee, then you, of course, offer to pay the bill. It's fair, but I don't, I, I don't buy coffee. <laughs> okay, well, I think it's good to buy their coffee. And I'd like you to pay me coffee. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah um, definitely follow up afterwards, right? To keep them in the loop. When you talk to somebody, make sure to get their email. Get their phone number so you can follow up at a later stage with more questions and say thank you, right? Be very appreciative because they're spending the time helping you. Uh, does the focus process only work for a new product? Oh, uh, no. It can work for any product that's not working to your success level. Now, and then when I say work, that mean it doesn't guarantee that you will meet your success criteria. It is a process to determine whether or not you can meet your success criteria. So, um, so yes, you can apply it to everything. It depends on the culture, like how deep you can go, but uh, absolutely, yeah. for sure. Isabella asks, uh, what, are, what about the use of business model canvas, an empty map, a focus exercise? What are the differences on them? Can we use them all? We talked about that already. We talked about that already. You, you can use them all. The focus framework is the more tangible way of actually utilizing uh, or, or testing the assumptions. So the business model canvas is good for visualizing all the different assumptions that you're making and understanding a complete picture of your business. When you have that, you suddenly realize, hey, all we did was to set a <laughs> list, make a list of guesses. Where there's actually no facts on this business model canvas. So we need to test that. The way to test it is using the focus framework. Uh, does the innovation process, the focus framework, work the same way for creation of services? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mariana. <laughs> My uh, girlfriend's a psychologist. We used it on her business, and she's killing it right now. What can you do? We answer that. 
what has been the main role of lean methodology inside companies, and does it make corporations more flexible? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, so lean manufacturing, where lean comes from, has been used a lot, so just heads up, that's a thing. Um, I don't know to what extent lean startup has actually been adopted within large corporations. I know there's some folks doing some training on it, but I, I can't actually speak to the effectiveness of it. I, I don't do it. Yeah. So we filled up my hard drive with these questions, and uh, and then we didn't realize, but we were running real crazy late, and uh, Henry had to go. So you got me for the last round of questions, but I'm going to see if I can knock them out of the park here. So next question, Anna asks, what's the most critical or most important step in focus? The answer is the next one. you got to go through them in order. It's sort of like asking, you know, what's the most important uh, stage of setting off a rocket. Like all of them have to be done. If they're not done, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, this is already scaled down a lot. There's a ton of other stuff that's going to go into your business. Like we don't talk at all about quote unquote branding. We don't talk about legal. We don't even talk about co-founders. Like there's a lot of stuff that's also involved. But this is like the slim down, most focused, <laughs> see what I did there. Focused version of what you need to do to get your validation. Uh, Beto asks, what if I have a good answer in the early adopters but not in the utility testing? So if that means that you're not getting validation in the utility testing, that means that either you got to find another way to solve the problem or it's not the right answer for you. It's not going to be the business that you want to build. So you can roll back and you can say, well, what if I try and sell something else to folks? Maybe I can get currency for another version of a solution to the problem. All right. Uh, Luis asked, how a early adopter become an innovator? All right, so I think Luis is asking about the innovation adoption curve, that there are, there's another sub-segment of early adopters uh, called innovators. Uh, if that's true, then Luis, good job. You're smart. You know you're crossing the chasm. Uh, for this distinction, I don't even worry about it. It's more of a teaching tool and teaching exercise to help people think about their very first customers are going to be people who are actively trying to solve the problem. If you meant something else there, then I'm sorry. I'm not going to have anything useful to add. Okay, next up. Uh, is the equilibrium point the right measurement metric of success for any startup company? Equilibrium point is not a, a term that I'm familiar with. Maybe a break-even, maybe a financial break-even. If that's true, I would say no because, uh, because we want to... Well, I'm just going to finish that one. If it's just break-even revenue-wise, obviously that's not going to cut it because we need to make money. Um, maybe supply and demand is the right equilibrium? It, and maybe? <laughs> so I don't really know. Unfortunately, I, I, can't, I can't tell what you're asking for. Um, but the right success metric for your company will ultimately come down with what's the right thing for the people in the company. So it typically it's the people at the top who will define success metrics. So if you've got shareholders, ultimately that's going to be your success metric. Um, but if you're working in a new innovation team, and maybe it's your boss or your boss's boss, they will define the success metric for the team. Okay. Um, Fabi asks, is it more important to make a massive innovation into a small segment or to make a moderate innovation into a wide market segment. All right, so interesting question, but I got to say that I'm not the theory person. Um, that I play around in practical, like let's get down, let's do some stuff. So maybe uh, one of the business theorists can talk about this. And of course, it depends on what you measure by better. What does better mean? Does it mean more revenue? Does it mean more impact? Um, so I don't know <laughs> is the question. I also, uh, when it comes down to actually building a company and building a business, I'm a real big fan of starting from bottoms up. That means I'm going to go talk to customers first and bring in a measure for how things are looking bottoms up. Um, and so I'm going to be really focused on that as opposed to sort of grandiose ideas and like, oh, we should do, we should innovate in this area because it's the sector, blah, blah, blah. That's all very inside the building stuff. I'm all about like, let's go test it with our customers. Let's see if we can actually do something here. And then we'll be able to extrapolate whether or not we can build the impact innovation results that we want. Okay. Uh, all right. Next up. Does the Carlos asks, does the prototype designs should be done before currency testing in order to have a successful pre-order? Great question. I think it depends on what's going to require to make a pre-order. 
So for example, I um, sold an iPhone app pre-order style. So we got the iPhone app and I was trying to test whether or not people would buy it. The, <laughs> the prototype I built was you know, just a mock-up. I talked a lot about the problem, talked about like sort of how we were going to solve it. And then I showed, like, hey, here's a little mock-up. Here's what sort of the screen looks like. So if that's the prototype, that's what you mean, boom, you're done. Um, for the book that I'm writing right now, uh, the prototype that I have is a picture of the book, right? a picture of a book. Um, so I, you know, I'm working on the actual stuff behind the scenes. You can see here's what the focus framework looks like right now um, in book form. But uh, it depends on the least amount of prototype that you can build, the simplest version of the prototype you can build to get the pre-orders. If you're not finding that you get the pre-orders that you want, then you may have to go develop some more. Um, but, but go and talk to your customers and figure out why they're not buying. On the, on the book side, uh, so I've been testing stuff and I've been getting, I've been achieving my success metrics, which is great, but I had some hypotheses that I thought, okay, you know, focus, it's got five letters in it, I'm selling it as one book. What happens if I turn it into five different books, one for each phase? They could certainly use their own their own books. And I thought, oh, this would be a really interesting offer. I thought people would really like that. So I built a prototype, which is now instead of one book that says focus on it, it's five individual books. And I put that up on the landing page. And I tested how many people bought it. And the number of people who bought it was significantly lower than I thought. Um, so in that case, my new prototype was, was five versions. Um, now I've gone back to the single version and it's looking good again, but I might try to get a little more fidelity or increase the optimization conversion rate. I might actually try to include sample chapters on the, on the website. That's more a significant prototype and I'll see, does that have an impact on my conversion rate? So what we're really doing is we're just listening to our customers very astutely and trying to figure out what is going to serve them best and give us the most data. So simplest version of the prototype possible. All right, Regina asks, how do you know your market has potential in, uh, your product has potential in the market? Um, you go through the focus framework, like that's, that's it. Like, this is how you start. Um, you're going to go talk to a group of people. You're going to figure out if there are any early adopters. If there are, you're going to try and mention the channel. If there are, you're going to try and get some money. That's how you determine whether or not there's any potential in the market. If you're talking about like high level market stuff, like, hey, do we think there's any need for sports bras at a large market? Like, I mean, you might as well just go make something up because your guess is going to be as good as anybody, right? Um, we are not really good at predicting at large scales, in my opinion, the success of a particular product. You might be able to measure how many women are out there who play running sports. You might be able to get a sense there. But do we know whether or not a product is going to fit in the market? We, for that, we've got to go dive down. We've got to go talk to individual customers. Last question. Dan asks, how much time and money is convenient to invest in? Oh, I did this one already. As much as you need to. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, these are fantastic questions. Just phenomenal. Um, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. My name is uh, Justin Wilcox. Uh, that was Henrik Scheel. And he, uh, uh, I'm available, Justin, at CustomerDevLabs.com. Um, uh, that's my email. Or you can just go to CustomerDevLabs.com. All right. Hope to talk to you guys soon. Bye.